In the past, I've mentioned a type of disco light called a moonflower, and this is a really old Tungsten one. I mean to say it's really old, it's not really immensely old, but it certainly predates the LED version, which was actually surprising when the LEDs came out. Oh, sorry, this is a, a panel I built a while ago. It's covered in different projects where I adapt a modern LED moonflower uh, with uh, my own circuit boards. But the modern ones are based on a matrix of standard LEDs. However, in the old days, it was uh, kind of simpler. Let me plug it in. Pow. It's very quiet, but you can't leave it on all the time. And if you point it at uh, a surface, you'll see it creates a sort of pattern of dots. Note this dark section here. There's a reason for that. And normally something like this would have a motor rotating those dots, either just in one direction continually or rocking them backwards and forwards in times of the beat. And if I point this at a wall, just unplug it, because it does get very hot. If I point it at a wall, uh, it actually projects that pattern of dots on the wall. But each dot individually looks like this. It comes up and then it's a sort of pattern like that and down and you'll recognise that immediately as a sort of a filament in a lamp. Well, you might not recognise, particularly these days, that it's the filament inside a tungsten halogen type lamp. So um, how did they create so many dots from one lamp? Let me show you, it's super simple, but it uh, sacrifices efficiency greatly as a result of that. I shall get a screwdriver here and I'll pop the sides off, or pop the lid off more appropriately. So it's held on by four self-tappers. Power incidentally is 50 watts. It comes with a warning in the back that says, important, you must give this unit a five minutes break to cool down after 15 minutes of continuous use. Please turn off the machine before changing the bulb or opening the housing. Please use the correct bulb only. Indeed. Because otherwise it would be bad news for the little power supply. So I'll get the other screw out here. And this screw out here. And the lid will come off. And it will reveal... Now let's see. You're going to see this. Okay. I'll just put the lid down there. It will reveal the lamp. The lens. That barrier there that stops the light shining straightly through and then a parabolic dish with uh, mirrors on the front of it. Let's get that dish out. So that is adjustable to a degree that has slots in the bottom. You're not going to see that too well. I'll tilt it until you can see it. There we go. Slats. So if I unscrew these, I'll be able to take the reflector out. And this is the bit that would normally have been coupled onto a standard um, synchronous motor. And it's the type of synchronous motor that doesn't have a specific direction. There we go, it's quite smart. It's a neat little uh, array. This is the all-white version because it's cheap. The coloured versions either had lacquered uh, mirror squares, because these are all just manually glued into this parabolic dish. Or they had dichroic squares, which were more expensive and gave a sharper colour of light, but it still wasn't. It looks a bit like a bug's eye, doesn't it? A bug's eye view. Is that going to be a guy? Are you even going to see my face? No, you're not. It's very odd. Um, but uh, they had the coloured versions, but the, the coloured ones were much less efficient because ultimately they used colour subtraction. So inside this we also have... Oh, what is that? What is that? What's it connected to? It's connected to live. There's not much on neutral. This is a capacitor. This is a suppression capacitor, either for noise compliance or to try and stop the little power supply blowing up. Ew. Yeah, let's pop the power supply out. Am I going to? No, let's... Uh, yeah, we will, because I've said... I've said I was going to do it, and I shall do it. And I'll show you how this thing works in the first place, how it creates that effect, although you may have guessed yourself already. I'm kind of regretting uh, saying I was going to pop this apart, because I suddenly realised that those are locking nuts. Hopefully I'm going to be able to get access to the other one. If not, it may be a party pooper for this particular task. We'll see what happens. There is one out that I can actually reach with the pliers. The other one is... Probably going to be somewhat harder. Is it? Is it going to require? Is it going to require tools? Yeah. Right. Tell you what. I'll I'll take that out afterwards. Let me bring in the notepad. And fuck ass. Down on the notepad, pal. 
So what actually happens is that the lamp with its filament in here uh, is blocked from the lens by that metal plate and the lens is not that far in front of it. So it's about here. So the light can't directly shine through the lens. Otherwise, it would just become a spotlight. Um, but the light radi radiates out literally. This is why it's so inefficient in all directions. You know, it really does radiate. And a lot of it gets absorbed by that metal plate. It's just such a wasteful thing. Literally, if this was a sphere uh, that represented the light output of the lamp, then the area that was actually caught by the parabolic dish would literally be about that much in that sphere and the rest of it all round, 360 degrees, is completely wasted. It's really inefficient. But having said that, it was more important to get the visual effect. So we had a dish of parabolic mirrors like this. And where the light would actually bounce off that, it would be reflected back and the curvature of the parabolic reflector here and the lens was such that it would create a splash of light coming out like that and it would be it wouldn't just be a narrow beam it would be a fair splash and it would shine back and a lot of it would be blocked by that metal plate again but the rest of it would pass through the lens and get collimated sharpened up and it would uh, basically well, focus more than anything else and it would go and create that sharp image of the filament on the wall that's it. And, and it did that with every single reflector. And when you had the music, it would just be basically bumping backwards and forwards. And it wasn't any fancy motor direction control in many of them. It was just a synchronous mains motor being pulsed on and off by a track in time to the beat. And it just picked a random direction that started. And it was pretty good. It created lots of beams moving in the air. And when that's all there was, it was perfectly acceptable. Thank you very much. Now... I'm going to get some tools and I'm going to try and get this power supply out and hopefully this is going to be fairly straightforward to open. Right, tell you what. One moment, please. Oh, that was regrettable. Having made the flippant comment, oh, I'll just open that as well. It was like getting that out involved. It involved my little mini socket set. It involved extension bars. It involved mirrors so I could actually, like, view what was underneath the underneath the actual unit itself because the way it's mounted. But it is out. It took a while, but it's out. This is an electronic halogen driver. The first one's contained... I'll just zoom up a tiny little bit. The first one's contained uh, just traditional transformers. And they weighed an absolute ton, but they were super reliable. These electronic power supplies were very prone to overheating in these style of lights and would often go bang. I get the feeling that might... They've had a few go bang and they've put the capacitor in or that's why they're really saying don't run it for too long because if they get too hot they will fail. But the gist is this. The main supply comes in and it actually goes through this resistor here and it goes down. I'll draw this out later on. I'll actually maybe make a video about it. Um, but it uh, has a bridge rectifier down here based on four diodes. But there's no smoothing capacitor because it doesn't actually turn it into smooth DC. It actually rides the sine wave. And this transformer here is connected. One uh, terminal of the primary is connected to the midpoint of these two capacitors. And one end of the capacitors is connected to positive. One is, end is connected to negative. And then these transistors alternate the other leg. They're bridged together and will connect to the other leg of this um, to the positive and negative rail. And that basically allows the transformer to be run at very high frequency along the sine wave. It's got a little feedback toroidal core here, and it's got a little trigger start circuit here based on that little diac down there. Uh, so basically speaking, along the sine wave, instead of actually uh, doing what so many uh, traditional power supplies, DC power supplies would do, instead of drawing its current at the peak of the sine wave because it's converting from AC to DC and then sort of switching it, this one actually draws it as a series of spikes all over the whole sine wave. Well, let me Let me doodle that down. I could have doodled everything I showed you there, but I didn't. That's a total whiteout. Mm -hmm. Let's back out a bit from that. So, um, this thing has pretty, it's almost, it's near unity. It's 0.98 power factor. It's very good. And the reason for that is that that sine wave, the power is being drawn across it. Well, that's a, that's a very, very 
in balance sine wave. There we go, that's even worse. Uh, but it's drawn as a series of spikes along each half of the sine wave. It's worth mentioning that the output of these units is not 12 volts. If you've ever connected LED lamps to a halogen lighting transformer and they've failed, uh, there's a possibility that uh, they didn't like the fact that it's putting out spikes of up to 31 volts or so. It averages out around about 12, what they call SELV, safety equivalent low voltage. Yes, there's so many. SELV has a couple of meanings. Um, I shall make a video about this in its own. That's that's worth doing. But the advantage of this is it was cheaper than the, the transform because the transformers are very heavy. It was also lighter, which reduced the shipping costs of the light and also uh, the... Uh, shipping costs and manufacturing costs, really. And it meant that it was uh, lighter to hang. I just lost where I was going there. But there we go. That really covers it up. The... the Traditional Moonflower had the parabolic reflector, which is very attractive in its own right. It's very, it's a very neat little thing. It had the light source, which was just ultra inefficient, and then it had the lens here. Oh, worth mentioning that you know, having lost you know most of the light already from the lamp, then so much is lost on the way back out because a lot of it splatters off the, the sides as well. It's just incredibly efficient. This was rated about 50 watts. The equivalent LED one would be probably about 10 watts, if that, uh, for more beams that are brighter. So um, this thing uh, that I made, it's, it's about, was it rated 4 watts? If that, it really wasn't very high at all. And it produced, uh, it produced, um, well, this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. It's got 36 dots of light. Mine had 64 dots of colored light. So, um, big leaps and bounds. Uh, the only way you'd get one of these ones now is just as a sort of like a historic novelty. Oh, look at the, the lens. Has been kind of glued in, but it's loose. It's got a uh, little catches there, but they've only put glue at the top because that's only where they could reach. It must have been stopped at Vibrating Transit. But there we go. Interesting. A traditional tungsten moonflower.